when that book came out in 2001, of course the industry didn't like it. And when I went on the book tour, uh, at every stop there was a, a hired lab coat, as Milt Bowling likes to say, who was available to go on the television and, and say that Carla was crazy. But the most significant thing that happened was that the insurance industry, who was responsible for the product liability coverage for the cell phone industry, looked at the research. They looked at the fact that the industry had funded the research. And they began a process of excluding health risk claims from product liability coverage. So that by 2003, the cell phone industry had no insurance to cover claims of health problems coming from the use of the phones. In 2002, a number of lawsuits had been brought against the cell phone industry. <clears throat> when the discovery process in those lawsuits began, they were able to look at some historic records in the various companies' files. They found some interesting things in there. For instance, in the 1995-1996 time frame, a number of different cell phone companies had filed for patents to cover technology that would make phones safe. And while one branch of the industry was filing for those patents, and to get a patent, you have to have a rationale, you have to have data, and it's reviewed by the government. They were granted those patents. And at the same time, when you bought a new cell phone in the user's manual, there was wording that said there is no evidence whatsoever that cell phones are dangerous. And oddly enough, through the end of the 90s and all the way up to today, you will see in those cell phone users' manuals quotes referring to opinions by government regulatory authorities like Health Canada being offered as proof that there's no danger. In the old days of this technology, 1999, one of the things that the industry did in 1999 and 2000 was to go around and buy up as many scientists as they could so that they could control not only the research, but also control the dissemination of the research. Because the industry had to keep a lid on the issue because of the litigation. The only group that had independent money from 1999 to 2004 to conduct follow-on research was the European Union. And the European Union put in place a program that involved 15 different laboratories across Europe. And the idea was, in the first instance, to see whether or not the findings that raised the red flags that we had identified could be corroborated. They finished that research in April of 2004. The information was suppressed until December of 2004. And when that information was made public, not only had they corroborated leakage in the blood-brain barrier, genetic damage in the form of micronuclei, but numerous other studies had been done, epidemiological studies and laboratory studies, showing that the radiation from a cell phone caused a variety of 
health effects, cancer being only one. They also took the research a couple of steps further so that we were beginning to be able to see the mechanisms of harm that were actually taking place. What we learned in the first instance was that the cell phone carrier frequencies, 1900 megahertz for example, that's a wave that is oscillating at 1900 million cycles per second. To put that into context, your heart beats at two cycles per second. That's two hertz. So 1900 megahertz is 1900 million cycles per second. Turns out that that oscillation is too fast for your biological tissue to recognize it. So your biological tissue doesn't know that it's there. It's invisible. And you know what? That would be good news if you didn't want to talk on the phone. But what we've learned now is that because information needs to be deciphered on either end of a phone call, that information needs to be bundled into packets. And the packets have to be small enough so that programs can unwind and interpret the information. And when you take those packets of information and put them on top of the carrier wave, a secondary wave is formed. And that secondary wave oscillates in the Hertz range. And in the Hertz range, your biological tissue can recognize it. What we've learned is that when an information carrying secondary wave is in the presence of biological tissue, after about 30 seconds, the biological cell membrane, whether it's a brain cell or a nerve cell or a blood cell, recognizes this electromagnetic field as a foreign invader. Once that recognition occurs, the cell begins a series of biochemical responses that are intended to protect it. So when the cell recognizes the invader, it says, we need to protect ourselves. And it sends messages to surrounding cells. I am under siege. You're going to be under siege. Let's protect ourselves. And what the cell membrane does is it closes the doors. It closes the active transport channels that carry nutrients from the interstitial fluid into the cell and carry waste products from the cell out into the interstitial fluid. When those active transport channels are closed down, nutrients cannot get into the cell and waste product cannot get out. So waste product builds up inside the brain cell and the blood cell and the nerve cell. Part of the waste product are free radicals. Normally free radicals are not found inside cells. Free radicals are usually big molecules that are found in the interstitial fluid. So now you have a buildup inside the cells of free radicals. And the free radicals interfere with normal DNA repair processes. Now you see every day in our bodies, each of us have millions of DNA breaks. And the reason that we look the same today as we did yesterday is because our bodies know how to put the broken DNA back together again. The buildup of the free radicals inside the cell disrupts the ability of the cells to repair the broken DNA. And you know what? When pieces of DNA come into contact with the free radicals, they break off. And some of them form membranes around themselves. And that is where the micronuclei came from. Now, as the cell 
<clears throat> tries to function, do its job. For example, if it's a blood-brain barrier cell and the free radicals are building up inside the cell, it can't do its job anymore. That's why the blood-brain barrier opens. Cellular dysfunction. When a cell knows that it can no longer do its job, a process called apoptosis is triggered. And apoptosis is programmed cell death. It's a cell committing suicide because it knows it can no longer do its job to make room for a new cell to come in to take over for it. When the apoptosis is triggered, the cell membrane disintegrates and everything that's inside the cell simply is released into the inter interstitial fluid, which is the river between the cells. That would be a good thing, except that the micronuclei have membranes so that now you release these wild pieces of DNA into a nutrient-rich environment in the interstitial fluid. And the micronuclei can clone themselves then, and they can proliferate. And that is a mechanism for the development of a tumor. Now, under normal circumstances, when you have micronuclei in the interstitial fluid, your body recognizes this as a foreign invader. So it sends a message to the immune system that says, I need some T cells over here to eat this thing up so we can get rid of it. But this is not a normal circumstance. Because the other thing that happens when the electromagnetic radiation causes the cell membranes to close down the active transport channels, it also compromises the ability of those cells to talk to surrounding cells. So intercellular communication is disrupted. And this is very, very important because if you look at the way your body is built, you begin with molecules that form a cell. And then when you put a bunch of cells together and they're talking to each other and doing a common job, we call that a tissue. And when you put a bunch of tissues together that are talking to each other and doing a common job, we call that an organ. And when you put a bunch of tissues and organs together and they're talking to each other and working together, that's an organism, and a human being is an organism. It is all dependent on intercellular communication. If you disrupt the communication process, nothing works efficiently. So what happens is that the message that should go to the immune system to say that we have a micronucleus here that we need to get rid of never gets there because the radiation has now disrupted the intercellular communication. Now, how serious is this? You know, 10 years ago, the incidence of autism in North America was one case in every 10,000 births. Last year, it was one case in 162 births. Autism spectrum disorder conditions include attention deficit disorder, hyperactive disorder, learning problems, sleep problems, headaches, inability to focus, unexplained irritability, anxiety disorder. Every one of those conditions has as a common element 